Good morning. Welcome this morning. If you would stand with us and join us. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old may know. Jesus, when I may you, you call my name. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious name You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your Hallelujah. Welcome this morning. Welcome. If you can testify that what we sang this morning is what happened in your life, that you have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the glorious light of the Son He loves, can we give Him a shout of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. It's great to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Hey, why don't you guys go ahead and greet one another real quick. Go ahead. Say hi to somebody you don't know. And um, All right.
You guys are awesome. Hey, let's, uh, if you're a first-time visitor here this morning, we want to welcome you. Can we just welcome our first-time visitors this morning? And if you would do us the privilege of sharing a little bit of your personal information with us on that visitor card so we can send you a letter thanking you for your visit today, we'd really appreciate that. Um, Don't forget about our all-church meeting next Sunday right after service over in the fellowship hall. Um, Behind that will be our all-church business meeting on Sunday, February the 9th. Again, after the service, I want to remind you that your giving statements are out front for you. Um, we're going to put a temporary um, hold on our, on our um, resurrection choir practices. We're going to wait till we get a little closer um, to Resurrection Sunday. And while we're passing by there, know this, that this congregation will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ together, and the only thing that would hinder that is the rapture of the church, okay? So we are moving forward no matter what we're doing. Um, And we, uh, there's going to be a rally and walk for life Saturday the 25th. Um, I think they're all meeting over at Gibble Park, so if you want to be involved in that, that begins at 10 a.m. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. And how much more do you love us? And uh, as we enter into a time of worship, friends, I want to remind you to engage, encourage you to engage in what the Holy Spirit's doing in this place, that Allow him to to encourage you, raise your hands, lift your voices, pray out loud the the, the praises of our our risen king. That's what we're here this morning for. We're here to worship openly and freely, and so I encourage you in that this morning. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would receive our praises, that you would receive our worship. Be glorified in all that's said and done here today. And we pray all this in the name of Christ Jesus and everybody in the house who agreed said, Amen. God bless you all. How great the chasm there lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence, 
the roaring lion and declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to break. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Whoa. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope there you are my living hope Amen praise him this morning Lord we thank you Lord Jesus that you are our hope our living hope Lord God that you are alive, Lord. If you personally need a word of encouragement spoke over you this morning, I'd like to, I'd like to pray a word of encouragement over, here, over you this morning. If you need encouragement this morning, come down and let Tina and I agree in prayer for your encouragement this morning, that you would be encouraged in the Lord. Amen? Precious is my Savior's blood. The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame. The image of love upon death's frame. If having my heart was worth the pain. Joy could you see beyond the grave If love found my soul worth dying for How wonderful, how glorious My Savior's scars, victorious My chains are gone my debt is paid from death to life and grace to grace. If heaven now owns that vacant Great is the hope that lives in you. The passion that tore through hell like a rose. The promise that rolled back death and its stone. If freedom is worth a life, you my sin where is 
is my shame If love paid it all to have my heart How wonderful, how glorious My Savior's scars, victorious My chains are gone, my dead that cross when I see that cross I see freedom when I see that grave I see Jesus and from death to life I will sing your praise and the wonder of your grace when I see that cross I see freedom when I see that grave I see Jesus and from death to life I will sing your praise the wonder of your grace when i see that cross i see freedom when i see that grave i see jesus and from death to life i will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace How my soul will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace How my soul will sing your praise I want how glorious my Savior's scars, victorious, my chains are gone, my debt is paid, from death to love you we thank you lord we thank you for your scars lord god that that you took lord god for us that you paid the price lord god that we owed we thank you lord god that you have saved us lord god and, and now you walk with us you'll never leave us or forsake us lord lord we lay ourselves before you and let us surrender ourselves to you fully let us hold nothing back. Let us leave it all at your feet. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Desperate for you, desperate for you, I surrender. Drench my soul. I 
hunger and thirst with arms stretched wide I know you hear my cry speak to me now speak to me now I surrender I surrender I surrender I want to know you more Yes, I want to know you more I surrender I surrender I want to know got permission from Pastor Mark to share something that was on my heart this morning, and it ties directly into the song we just sung. The song, in that song, we, we declared the words, I want to know you more. 
And the challenge is, the question is, is that true in your heart? Is that something you've set before your eyes as Paul called the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus that he was willing to press every moment of every day towards? This week, Jeff's um, word to us last week has been on my heart, especially that last line, enjoy the journey. As I meditated on it and I prayed on it and I thought about it, it became more and more real in my heart as a call from God to us. You saw all the hands go up, my, my hand, Pastor Mark's hand, all the hands that went up. We agreed that this was a message for us from the Lord. This means that it's not a, a momentary passing thing. It's not something that, that we just clap about in that service and move on. It's an instruction. Our God speaks to us moment by moment in the spirit. And he said, enjoy the journey. I was reading in John's epistles. And he writes to the fathers and to the sons and to the children. He exhorts them in each stage of their life. And I wanted to add that here for us this morning. This is what the Lord laid on my heart. If you're a young man in here, just getting into the world, you're at the beginning of a journey, but your God is going before you through that whole journey. Enjoy the journey. If you're a middle-aged man like me, your 30s, 40s, you've been through a bit of journey. You've been through a few places, but it's not over yet. The Holy Spirit is going before you. Enjoy the journey. I've seen this week brothers and sisters in the Lord who are in their, in their end of their life. They've, they've run the race their whole life. They're people I look up to, people in this sanctuary, people in my family. And they wonder if they did the job good enough, if they succeeded at all the things they were supposed to, if they had said all the right things at the right places. Guess what? Your God was going with you through the journey. Enjoy it. Look back on it and see the victories that God has given you. No matter what stage of your life you're in, and not just for the next few moments that we're in this, in this world, in this church, in this body together, but for all eternity, God says, enjoy the journey. Hallelujah. I always like to put scripture behind what I'm saying, Matthew said, or Jesus said in Matthew 24 and tw 7, 24 and 25, he said, Anyone who he then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. You can enjoy the journey because the rock will not change. Let's go to the Lord in prayer in that understanding that whatever we're going through, whatever the brothers and sisters that we're about to be praying for are going through, God is right here. He's with us in this moment. He's going before us and he's never going to leave us and he's never going to forsake us because he said so and he doesn't go back on his word. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you in boldness this morning, encouraged in this whole week to stand before my brothers and sisters and be reminded that you are in the moment by moment journey. You're the God who set it up from the beginning of time. You're already at the end. You were at the beginning. There's nothing that goes outside your view. There's nothing that goes outside your power. There's nothing that can resist your will. There's nothing that can come against us. Every correction that you bring, every trial that we go through will only build our endurance and in the end work all things for our good. We stand loved by the Lord because of the work of Jesus Christ and we cry out with our hearts, God, send your spirit so we will know you more day by day so the journey will take on its, its life that it's intended to to, that we will be molded into the images that we are supposed to be. Father, I lift my brothers and sisters up to you for Monica and Deborah and Darlene and Elisa and Fred. Lord, I just ask that you would just 
be with them in this, in this time of trial, that you would heal those bodies, that you would send down and let us see the miracle working of your power and the moment by moment what you do in their lives, that you would bring not only physical healing, Lord, but you would bring all of those around them to understand the power of God and the love of God in each one of their lives, that their families would be encouraged, that their lives would grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, their, he, that the healing that we bring would be a triumph and a victory, a praise to you and that we wouldn't be left wondering when our God does miracles. Lord, we praise you for, for victories that are already done. We know that you're already in the future. You've already set the plans, and they cannot be shaken. The enemy can rattle his spear. He can, he can curse at, at the, the saints of God, but what you have blessed cannot be cursed. What you have put your angels charge around can't be assailed. We may go through trials. We may go through battles. We may have to pull down the strongholds around us. We may have to stand counter to a culture that hates you, but we're, in the end, we cannot be defeated, Lord, and I claim that victory over the names that we just prayed. Lord, for Don and Joy's heart and lungs, for Julie, for Carol, for Lupe, for the Lord, for Sandra, for Angel, for Heather, Lord, these names, I lift their, their physical ailments up to you, and I just ask that you would just touch them in the name of Jesus, that you would heal them, that the great physician's work on the cross would be shown in their lives, in their spirits, in their souls, in the very depths of their being so that it transformed their very surroundings, change the atmosphere around them, Lord, change the, the victory, the, 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 what the enemy shows as a defeat into a victory in every way, the way you do over and over and over again. Even when we don't understand what you're doing, we put our faith and trust in you, Lord, for the Pierce family and for Belinda and her family and the loss of family members, Lord. I ask that you would strengthen them and give them peace, that they would be able to uh, process what's going on in their lives, understanding that they stand on a rock, that they stand on, on a foundation that can't be shaken, and that even in the, the valley in the shadow of death, you're there with them, that you've prepared a table before them, even in the face of enemies that they're not sure how to overcome. Lord, give them peace that passes understanding, that keeps their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we have a list of many people who are going for surgery, for Terry, Derek, Diane, Fred is recovering, Lord. I ask that you would make him able to eat again for Richard's upcoming surgery, Lord. Tony, Joanne, Jennifer, who's in the hospital right now, Lord. I just ask that you would be with each and every one of these in the stage where they're at, that you would provide wisdom and, and strength in the doctor's hands. You would provide no infectious uh, substances in the, in the surgery rooms, Lord, that you would sterilize that place before they even walk in, that they would come out with a quick healing and a quick recovery and a testimony of their God's goodness in each thing that's, that's happening there, Lord. It, Lord, and if it be possible, let the surgeries pass without need. Let there be healing where, the, where we can proclaim the, the victory of God. Let us see your victory in every way that you choose to do it. And with these brothers and sisters and all of the brothers and sisters in the congregation, I declare that, that don't listen to our small prayers. Do your big what's on your mind. Just as Jesus prayed in the garden, not our will, but yours be done. Father, we pray out of love for our brothers and sisters. We ask for everything to, to go good for them. But you have plans for them that are beyond even what we can imagine in love for them. Father, we just ask that you work those plans in each one of these that are facing surgery, Lord. That you would just, you would just touch each and every moment of it in any way that you're going to do it. Let us see how good it is. Because you do things far better and beyond anything we could even ask or think. And we believe that in Jesus' name name. Lord, we have church meetings coming up, business meetings. Teach us how to be in unity. Teach us how to, how to put a church body together with a, an outward focus where we strengthen each other and, and build up for the mission of Jesus Christ to touch this broken community that we live in, to touch this broken world that we live in. Lord, that you would clean up the streets of Hemet, that you would send your, your spirit out before us to touch people's hearts and lives, and that people who were addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or anything else that is in bondage in their lives, they would be released from it in the name of Jesus, and that you would use us as tools to do that. Father, that you would go before us in this next season the way you have gone before this church for the last 30 years. The doors would stay wide open. The, the family would meet 
together in unity. Lord, all of the things that we read about in the, in the book of Acts, how the, the church met together and met each other's needs, how they met the community's needs, how they, they changed the world, not with swords and with rules and laws, but with love. Lord, let us be that body of love that touches every heart and soul in this community. Lord, give us this valley. Give us this nation. Give us your spirit moving forward that we would have victory everywhere we turn and that your kingdom would be filled up, that the, the harvest would not be empty of harvesters, that the, the, the ripe harvest that you've provided would be in our hands to bring into the storehouse for your glory and your praise. Lord, I praise your name and thank you for all of the missionaries around the world, the ones that are the ones that are here in this country, the ones that are around the world, the ones that are facing difficulty and trial, I thank you that I know that you are with them right now. I pray in confidence that it's not a wonder whether you provide what they need. You will be right there every moment as you have been with every missionary, as you were all the way back to the Apostle Paul and the original apostles who took your commission and went out into the world. They left their Judea, they left their Samaria, they went to the ends of the earth, Lord, and they were prosperous wherever they went. The, the stones and beatings couldn't stop Paul. The shipwrecks couldn't stop him. The, the sicknesses couldn't stop him. A viper jumping out of the fire couldn't stop him because he was on your mission. Lord, and I thank you that that power goes with your missionaries today. And I praise you. And I just ask you to continue that work around the world until it is time for us to go home. Until the, the harvest is reaped. Until every single soul that will be saved is saved. Until there's not one that hasn't heard the word of Jesus Christ. Father, let that begin right now in our hearts as we listen to Pastor Mark's message and the, and the music that's to come and the things that we're doing in the rest of this service. Let the Holy Spirit enlighten it to our hearts. Let it be the driving force for our week. Let us not neglect the rest of the times of the week. We can meet together, Lord, and praise you, Lord, in our jobs and in our in our work and all of the things that we're going to do this week in school as uh, our, our t high schoolers and our middle schoolers as they face school. Lord, I ask, ask that everything that happens on this campus be built around them to build them up to be successful in those arenas, to be successful servants of our King. And we pray this in confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Let's give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Come on up, ushers. Thank you for waiting on us um, as you prepare your tithes and your offerings this morning. I wanted to um, read a scripture to you as you open your heart this morning. Um, I'd like to, to pray God's word over, over you. Um, and the verse that's been chosen is um, Ephesians 20 from the Amplified Version. And uh, he writes... This um, now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is in work that is at work in us is able to carry to and that's carry out his purpose and to do super abundantly far and above all that we even dare to ask or think of infinitely beyond our highest prayers desires thoughts or dreams. I believe that when we honor God's word, he honors us. And by giving to what the Lord asks of us, he, that, that is able to um, um, empower God's word to have impact in our lives. Um, so Lord, thank you for the obedience of this, this congregation to your word. Thank you for putting on their hearts to give today. As I pray this verse over each one of you today, I just pray that God will indeed open the windows of heaven and meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in grace. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. So God bless you for giving today. Amen. Thanks for waiting on us, fellas. Um, Trish and Gloria, are you here? Come on up. Come on. Come on up. Can I have that? Uh, you, don't need to, you don't need to do anything to it. You don't need to do anything to it. thought we'd uh, share a, a quick testimony this morning. Some things happened to these ladies um, on the prayer walk, and I'm not going to uh, um, 
begin to uh, share that with you. I'm going to let them tell the story, and um, we'll give thanks to the Lord. <laughs> okay. Um, the Sunday before um, the first, I spoke up here about the prayer walk, and that service, uh, Pastor Mark talked about God in the midst of tragedy and darkness and how the Lord works, and that message really resonated with me because I'm very familiar with knowing God in the middle of some very deep darkness. And during the prayer walk, I did it modest style and just went out by myself. And I know Dennis in a group. And then Gloria here has something to tell us. <laughs> well, and, it, and what Erin just said, um, victory out of defeat. Uh, Trish was doing her walk. I saw her walking. And so I thought, well, I'll head her off and walk with her. So I, I parked my car and um, took my two little dogs, two little chihuahuas, out of the car. And as we started to walk, a huge, huge pit bull came, charged us. Um, I screamed. I was trying to get my dogs. I fell. He knocked down. He got my little four-pound chihuahua, put it in his mouth. It was chaos. And, and as he was, as he was um, using him as a toy, I was screaming. And my other little 11-pound chihuahua went and attacked the pit bull. Well, the pit bull got the 11-pound chihuahua. I didn't know that at the time. The people who owned the dog came, and, and I'm screaming. I'm hysterical. I don't, don't do well in emergencies. Um, I'm hysterical and screaming and screaming. I'm screaming at Trish. She couldn't hear because she had headphones on. Um, during all this time, some people from across the street came and used that opportunity to take my phone, take whatever I had on me. Um, because I wasn't paying attention. And I'm screaming at this girl who owned the dog. And I thought we were gonna, this is embarrassing, um, come to blows. She, she was shaking her finger, I was shaking my finger, we were both screaming at each other. She's saying, I'm trying to help you. And I'm going, oh yeah. And at that moment, and it only took a second, but at that moment, I remembered Romans, um, in Romans chapter 14, because it had been on my mind for, or in my heart for a while. And it was, um, why do you look down on your brother and sister with contempt? And who are you to judge someone? And in that moment, I screamed, I'm sorry. And it just stopped. It stopped the whole, it stopped everything from what it could have turned into. And, and turned into what it did. Um, it, it fast forward to the next day, my, my little dog, was what had been bitten. I didn't know. It took him, there was nowhere in Hammett, so I took him to Temecula Emergency Head Hospital. And I thought he would be, she would be okay. The vet said, came out and said, no, she's critical. She's critical. She has to have major surgery. And even with that major surgery, she only has a 30% chance of living. And this is what it's going to cost. And I'm thinking, <laughs> That's impossible. I have no access. I have no way to do that. Well, I might not, but the Lord does. And he did. And my little dog had surgery. And uh, this was on January 2nd. Today is the 18th? 19th. Thank you. Today is the 19th. Um, and my little dog is running around the house chasing my cats. I'm sure now. She's still here. She had to have another surgery in between that. And again, I couldn't no access to funds, it was done. The second surgery was done. And what's wonderful about this is that through that whole time, through all those days, I kept saying, this is, a, I felt like Daniel's friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and when they were in, yes, when they were in the, um, when they were in the fire, and he said, they said, we will worship, we know the Lord can save us, but even if he doesn't, we will worship him. And that's how I felt, I felt like, even if my little dog isn't saved, I will continue to abide in the Lord and worship him. Well, and I was telling everybody in my sphere of influence that the Lord did save my little dog. My little dog had 30% chance. The Lord made a way. She's here today. And everybody in my sphere of influence, I can say, see, the Lord works. The Lord works. The Lord is real. And come to him. And God bless you, Lord. And thank you. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. okay. so, did you turn me off? Hello. 
So from all that, here we are praying for the community. Yes. We're claiming the community in Jesus' name. The whole thing was that. So within all that, Gloria found an opportunity to minister to exactly what we're going after. We're going in the highways and the byways, and she came face to face with somebody who was out there. She got robbed by the homeless, but the Lord used what Satan meant for evil, turned it around for good. And I went and met her yesterday at this place, and lo and behold, as we're there, one of the homies that came out, I, I know they're doing drugs, was one of my Helen's friends from three years ago. And just to see, look in his eyes and to stand there in the name of Jesus to know that there's hope. And we're still standing. Even in the middle of all this trauma is a witness. And that's where us as Christians, we, we're stronger than the drugs. The Holy Spirit is stronger than the addictive behaviors in this community. And that's where us people who are called by his name need to rise up and to show the hope and the love and the overcoming power. Satan is not stronger, but he is deceiving many. God has the victory. And that's what we need to walk in is in victory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And she did get her phone back. Well, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for um, the willingness of Trish and Glory to, to step out in faith and um, just go out into the community and pray like so many others, Lord. And I can't help but think but, uh, that maybe that the, the power of darkness was a little uh, agitated by their presence down there because that can be a very uh, dark place and so lord we thank you for showing yourself strong thank you for this testimony um, i pray by your spirit he who has ears let him hear what the what the spirit is is saying to the church through this testimony and many like them and we pray this in the name of jesus amen, amen. hey so if you have your bibles this morning um Let's turn to uh, Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to be picking it up in about uh, uh, verse 15 this morning. Um, we left off last week, and Paul also was uh, pointing out the providence of God um, in regard to his, his imprisonment. And the spread of the gospel, pointing out the providence of God in his imprisonment and the spread of the gospel. And he says in verse 12, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. We, said, we heard here this morning testifying that God worked good out of that bad experience. He also wrote to Timothy, remember that... Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel for which I suffer, suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not changed. Can we have some PowerPoint, please? God spoke through the prophet Isaiah declaring, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And what we perceive as a setback can very well be a set up for something greater than we can even think or imagine. The Lord said again through the prophet Isaiah, I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things yet not done. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. And then Job said of God, I know that, I, I know that you can do all things and there is no purpose of yours that can be thwarted. Those are some pretty encouraging scriptures, if you ask me. 
Because regardless of what circumstances may, may look like, regarding what we may, go, what we may be going through, what things are saying to us in the natural, God says, I'm above all of that. My plans and my purposes will be carried out. My word will not return to me void. If I say it's going to be, it's going to be. The question for us today is as, as, as we look at Paul in light of this uh, letter to the church at Philippi, are we willing to, to not be discouraged and stay in the will of God in spite of our circumstances? Are we going to stay with God, God's plan for us in the face of adversity? And regardless of what our circumstances might be telling us, personal, corporately, or, or otherwise, remember, we are saved, we are set apart by God for God's purposes, yet there is a battle that continues to rage. And we do battle, not on our back foot, but we do battle from a place of victory. And if you believe that this morning, I, can I get a witness to that? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Um, look with me at uh, uh, verse 15 here this morning in chapter 1 of Philippians. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambitions, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, rejoice. You know, there were those who were who were jealous of Paul, um, those, who were those who were happy that he was in jail, and now they had the opportunity to shine. Paul's out of the way. Let me get out there and show them what I can do. And this might have caused them to preach with even more energy, wanting, wanting to show themselves as effective as Paul. But Paul says the former preach Christ from selfish ambition. And Paul's saying, some preach Jesus just to increase their own influence. There were also those who, who thought, well, thought well of Paul and preached with more energy, but with good motives. And Paul said, regardless of their motives, Christ is being preached, and that's what's important. Like it or not, we have heard of ministers throughout history and even in our current culture at times, we have heard of ministers who have wonderful and fruitful ministry and at the same time we're living in sin and when that sin was found out, the consequences fell like dominoes. Sometimes later, these ministers can be found again in ministry and seemingly doing some fruitful things for the Lord. Two words come to mind here. Mercy and mystery. There are preachers and, and ministries out there that we would have nothing to do with. Or that we would not give one red cent to. And we don't condone that which, was, that which does not line up with scripture. But don't be surprised when you get to heaven that you hear somebody say, I got saved through that ministry. That God used that ministry to creak open a door to, to understanding of Jesus Christ and that, that, and that these, these people you know, eventually did come to faith in Jesus Christ, got on the right page, and were able to move forward. Romans 11.33 says this, Oh, the depths of of the riches, of the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Today, as in Paul's day, the preaching of God's word is done out of love for God and the lost, but also out of contention and insincerity. Regardless of the motivation, 
It's the word of God that works and not the messenger, friend. So let us rejoice that the word is being, re- being preached regardless of the motives and remembering to be mindful of our own. Look at uh, verse 20, 19 with me. For I, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, body, whether by life or by death. I don't know how this is going to play out, Paul is saying, but if they take and, and, and execute me, or I'm spared and I, and I get to live and continue on in this life, let the Lord Jesus Christ be magnified regardless. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Paul says clearly, he says, I know this will turn out for my deliverance. Regardless of what happens here, I'm going to be delivered. Talk about fully trusting God there. Paul says here, I may not know the details, but I know that God is at work in this situation. And I asked this morning, can we confidently say that in our lives and in the things that we are faced in, faced with? Can we can, can confidently say that this is of God, that he, he's either orchestrated this or allowed this, and he is at work in it, and he's going to allow it will turn out for our deliverance. Again, Paul's saying here, I may not know all the details, but I know that God is at work in this situation. My God is sovereign over all creation and everything that hap- happens in it, and he works out all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Paul knows that it is through, through prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit that he will persevere until he's delivered. He understands, let me say that again, he understands that it is through prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit that he is able to withstand these, these, this, this imprisonment, the, the, these obstacles, these hard times. He's able to make it through, the, through those times until God sees fit to deliver him and he's confident of that deliverance. Paul's saying that whether his listeners mocked him or emulated him, the am- impact of his stand for the gospel was as far as he was concerned was going to be a positive one. I'm going to do my part to stand in faith. I'm going to, I am going to persevere in full submission to God Almighty. And he was looking toward his future, looking f- toward his heavenly reward for that stand. And what we do for the Lord is never a waste. God is an excellent record keeper. And, and nothing gets by him. Everything that we do for him with the right motives in Jesus Christ is recorded. And we will be rewarded for that. But Paul is saying he's taken a stand. And you and I got to take a, a stand for Christ. Or we're in danger of falling for just about anything that the, the enemy or this world can throw at us. And when Paul says, according to my earnest expectation and hope, he is clearly, again, expressing some some words of faith. Paul shows great trust in God here in those words. Paul first trusted God that in nothing he's going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be sorry for any of this. they're, They're not making a fool out of me. They think they are, but they're not. And we need to remember that too. Nobody's making a fool out of any of us for a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible over and over promises that we will not be ashamed, but we, in fact, we will be richly rewarded for our stand. 
And he believed that God would not cause him to be ashamed or that God would turn against him at any point. This wasn't about being punished. God doesn't... I'm even going to leave that there. Paul was not being punished. Though he was in prison and waiting trial before Caesar, Paul had the confidence that he was in the center of God's will. I hope... I trust the Holy Spirit speaking to each of us this morning in, in our circumstances, whether, what, what, regardless of what they may be or what, what your mind is, is, is going to right now. I hope the, I, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to us through Paul's experience here. That even in difficulty, that, you know, we, can, we are in the center of God's will. If we're, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, if, we, if we've named Jesus as Lord, and you know in your heart whether or not you, that is you, that even in the midst of your struggle and trial and your heartache and all of that, you're very much in the center of God's will for you. And you knew God wasn't punishing. Again, God knew he wasn't punishing for something, him for something. As we glance back at um, verse 20, we mentioned, we mentioned um, his earnest expectation, Paul's earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But he says, with all boldness, as always, so now... Also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. And so I, I, I encourage us this morning to also magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Let us magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in our, in our, in our style, in our lifestyle. Let us magnify the Lord Jesus Christ by, by loving our neighbor as we are called to do repeatedly, repeatedly throughout Scripture. And let the, the bond of the, the Holy Spirit and our, and our love for one another tell the world that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Let, that, let, let those outward things be evident. Let the Lord Jesus Christ be magnified in these things. Let us be genuine in our relationships with one another. And, and let's be thankful for those that the Lord has placed around us. Sometimes the Lord can place some difficult people in our sphere of influence, but as God's ambassador, you're called to, to minister, to reach, to connect, to, to build relationship with that person in hopes of one day leading them to Christ. We call ourselves Pentecostals here, do we not? Can I see a hand if you're a Pentecostal? I'm going to challenge you this morning. Part of the Pentecostal distinctive is demonstrated like this. If I were to have a, uh, a whiteboard up here or something, what I would do is I'd put like five dots, black dots on there. I'd ask you to do that on a piece of paper. Maybe if you're taking notes, why don't you do this? Put in a circle, put five dots now, down. Now draw a line from each one of those dots kind of like a spoke outward. Now on that line, write the names of those five people that you are incur currently endeavoring to lead to Jesus Christ. Regardless of where you're at in your relationship with them, that you've, the Lord showed that person to you and you are endeavoring to connect with them on whatever shape or form, establish a relationship or continue a relationship, earn trust, solely to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ or attempt to, to share the Lord Jesus Christ with them. And if you can't fill that out, you need to question whether or not you truly are a, a, a Pentecostal because that's what being a Pentecostal is all about. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what we're all called to do, but that's we really identify with that as Pentecostals. We identify with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We invite the move of the Holy Spirit, but that's just not for, for to have wonderful church services and to, to have, the as Pastor Aaron said, not just to get a word that just kind of pumps us up for the hour or so we're here, but we're to take that word seriously and take it with us and, and put use to it. Jesus, you know, that's the reason for being filled with the Holy Spirit, is to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I trust you're full of the Holy Spirit. Are you taking that power? Are you taking that anointing? And are you speaking to people in your sphere of influence? Are you, are you strategizing to lead them to Jesus? Are you living your life? Are you, is your life a living epistle? Can people see that, you, that you, you know God and you live your life accordingly? That's a, that's, I think that's a fair question. Because for whatever reasons, repeatedly, the Holy Spirit keeps encouraging me. He takes me off of my notes and he keeps talking about this. And so I think he, I, I'm certain he feels that it's important for us to get it, to get it into our knower and make it a manner of life. That's what the church is. We are God's hands and feet upon this earth. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And we are called to, 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 to share the gospel. Where we're called to, yes, we're called to minister and to be kind and compassionate, all those things. But those are, those are, those are a, a means of opening doors to building trust and relationship to, to, to share Jesus. To share Jesus. Look at verse 21 with me, please. I know I'm kind of backing up here a little bit, rereading some things. But he says, Paul says here, for me to live, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose I cannot tell for I'm hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better nevertheless to remain in the flesh which is more needful for you and being confident of this I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming. So, to live is Christ and die, to die is gain. And so I asked the question here this morning, how do we establish what is truly a life transformed and encounter and discern between a life that is transformed or just that which is merely a religious experience. A life transformed or a religious experience. To live as Christ indicates a life transformed, not merely a religious experience. Think about this for a minute. As you look at that scripture down in front of you, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Leaving out the the name of Christ in that statement doesn't work at all, does it? I mean, what could you possibly put in there? You could put in there to live is, is success. To live is to be an accomplished musician or, or an athlete or whatever. And to die is gain. No, to live is Christ. And to, to die is gain. And while success and, and, and living out you know, your ambitions in life, you know, through the lordship of Jesus Christ is, is not a bad thing. Being an athlete and being successful are not bad things. But that's not life. That's just a part of life. Jesus Christ is life. Salvation is life. Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. And how many of us really live our lives for Christ? How many of us shut Christ out of certain areas of our life? Okay, I'll let you in this part, Jesus. You can kind of have, you can come here. Well, Jesus, you can come to my house, but you have to wait out here on the porch. Or you can come into the living room, but stay out of my room. There's stuff in there that's very private. Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And how many of us do that? Maybe not deliberately. Maybe we don't even stop to think that we're doing that. 
But how many places in my life and in your life do we shut Jesus out of? I'm, 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 I'm going to take care of this. But we need to give the lordship of Jesus Christ over to every area of our lives. And he says, and to die is gain. To die is gain. I understand that there's a three pyramids that were built in Gaza, which apparently um, these pharaohs uh, spent millions and millions of dollars, what would equal dollars, and man hours to build so that no one would forget them. Well, the pyramids are certainly there, and we have no idea who built them. So what are we saying here? It won't be too long that after we have departed from this life that our name will be completely forgotten upon this earth. To live is Christ. Psalm 103 says it like this, For as man his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for on those who fear Him, on those who reverence Him. In heaven our names are written in the Lamb's book of life where our reward is eternal and will not fade and we will never be forgotten. But even though Paul wanted to go to heaven, he knew that through his life, through his ministry efforts, people were going to be blessed. People were, God was going to use him to build people up and to bring people to faith. Even though heaven's the goal and heaven would be much better than what he was dealing with or what he could possibly hope for in his future upon this earth, that heaven was the goal and that was really what he was, was after. But to remain was also fruitful, fruitful for him in the area of reward, because there is a reward system in place. You know, Paul described getting a glimpse of heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, which brings me to a, um, I think my friends are asleep. Back. Oh, there they woke up. Thank you. Um, which brings me to a, um, a story I want to share with you. Um, Many of you probably heard the name of uh, Joni Erickson Tata, and she's a woman who has uh, experienced a lot of suffering. When she was but a teenager, she, uh, she was paralyzed from the neck down in a, in a, in a diving accident, and um, she would have never known it at the time, but, you know, prior to her accident, that God would give her a worldwide ministry. And um, she wrote a devotional and she calls it closer to the other side. And she shares this story about something mundane and, and somewhat personal. And it's this that uh, she says that uh, to wash my face, I have to pull my wheelchair up to the, to the, to the sink and, and put my head under the water. This chokes me up every time. I tried to read through it a couple of times Sunday. You can ask Tina. <laughs> and uh, um, she had to, get, to get her face washed, she has to pull up to the sink and put her head in the water. And her friend Dana goes at it, she says, lathering up her hair and stuff like that. And, and she said, Dana says, would you like me to wash your face while I got you lathered up? And she says, yes, I would. And so Dana begins to to wash her eyes and, 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 the, and the sides of her face. And, and Joni gasps. And Dana says, am I, am I hurting you? And she goes, no, please keep going. So um, as Dana dries Joni's hair and her face, she also has to, to dry tears from Joni's eyes. And she went on to explain to Dana and to us, that she, that by her eyes being washed and, and her cheeks being washed, it felt just, it reminded her of just how she did it before she was injured. And she, it got her to thinking that 
this is only for a little while. I'm not stuck here. I'm going to heaven. And in my glorified body, I will be able to touch myself again. I will be able to wash my face. And she says, she says that my past is farther away from me than my future in heaven. And so it is with us. Our past is farther away than our, than our future in heaven. And so if we were to ask, if we were to be asked what is Christianity, we could sum it up in this verse. For me to live, but to die is gain. And this statement has, is very personal as it is practical. In, in the personal, for me to live speaks of our manner of life in Christ. Jesus Christ is the author of life. He said that I'm, I've come that they might have life and, and have it more abundantly. Showing up on, somewhere on a certain day at a certain time during the week does not equal a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It may be evidence of something, but it's not evidence of a personal relationship. And I don't mean to be morbid here this morning, but how many people sitting in church across this country last week that had been attending church regularly for some time or no longer on this earth today. And how many of them will hear, well done, good and faithful servant? And how many of them will hear, depart from me, I never knew you? Matthew, Jesus said, in the book of Matthew, therefore whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. We can simply deny the Lord Jesus Christ by our manner of life. And there's a, again, there's a practical side to this. Some don't see the practi practicality right now. You know, we might say, they might say, I don't have time. I don't see the point. I don't want to give up X, Y, Z. Matthew Henry says this, those who know the value of Christ in heaven will radically acknowledge it far better to be in heaven than in this world, to be with Christ than to be with any creature. For in this world we are compassed about with sin, born to trouble, born again to it. But if we come to be with Christ, farewell sin and temptation, farewell sorrow and death forever. So it is a very practical thing to plan for your future, your eternity, especially given the fact you're going to be there forever. And it starts with repenting. And believe in the gospel. That's, what, that's the words of the Lord Jesus when he started his ministry. Repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so I ask you, if you're here this morning, why not make that decision right now? Why not do something very practical for your eternity? For your forever? I want to give you an opportunity to do right, that right now. There's no formula for entering into a relationship with Jesus. It's simply just what he said. Turn away from trying to make your, find your own way into heaven. Turn to him. Believe the good news. What is the good news? That Jesus Christ, God himself, came as a man in the person of Jesus Christ... He made a sacrifice on your behalf to cover your sins once and for all. That if you will trust him in that, that what he did on the cross is sufficient for your entrance into the kingdom of heaven, you will be saved. Pure and simple. So if you're here this morning and you've not made that decision, we're going to make it easy for you. We're all going to bow our heads and we're just going to pray a brief prayer together. And we're just going to 
mention those things to the Lord that we believe and that we're asking for salvation. So, believers, for the sake of those who may not have uh, made this decision yet or are struggling with that, could we just all pray it together as if we prayed it the first time? Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Your word says that if I believe in Jesus for my salvation, I will be saved. I repent of my sins. I look to you to stop sinning. And I receive you as my salvation. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I trust in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you prayed that prayer, as, as imperfect as it was, and you believe in your heart, if you've, you've confessed the Lord Jesus, you made him the Lord of your life, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you're saved. And you know whether or not you believe. So, so welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. So I want to call the worship team up right now. One of the things we spoke of earlier in, the, in this series was the, the concept of citizenation, and that's a made-up word, but it had to do with being influenced by our culture, what we watch, what we read, the friends we hang out with, what theological tribe we belong to. This influence that is always pressing down on us is very subtle, but it's also extremely powerful. And to keep ourselves from becoming completely spiritually tone deaf, we need to hear a truth from outside our culture. And again, I want to remind you and encourage you in that this morning, the truth about our world and about ourselves, that, that truth from outside of our culture is contained in the scriptures. This is God's love letter to each of us. This is God's revelation of himself to mankind. And I just want to, you know, as I prayed over some of you this morning for encouragement, there are some powerful words of encouragement contained in these scriptures that, that are just for you. Just for you in that. And I want to encourage you that this morning. And as we, as we uh, started out today, acknowledging that God brings good out of difficult so situation, he does allow us to go through tough situations for our good and his glory. There's an illustration that I read one time, and the guy was doing some work at a desk, and he had a... Um, he had a um, 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 cocoon on his um, windowsill and uh, it started to, to come out you know the butterfly started to come out and he was sitting there and it was taking forever for this butterfly to come out and uh, um, so he says he took a little exacto knife out of his desk and he, and he cut the cocoon so the butterfly could uh, come out and, you know, dry its wings and all of that. Well, he did that, and the butterfly came out, sure enough, but the, the butterfly died. Why? Because it wasn't strength. It, the, God had made it so that that fight to get out of the cocoon, cocoon made it strong enough so it could sur survive out of the cocoon. And many times, that's what God's doing in our life. He's, he's, he's uh, allowing struggle. He's allo allowing difficulty to strengthen us so we can spread our wings and be all that we can be for him. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm not dismissing. Let's uh, worship the Lord together, and I want to pray a blessing over you. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed. Constant grace remains a cornerstone. The things that we thought.
outward death, I'm breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be a real song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one I heart to do. Hopeless have found their hope. The orphans now. Give the Lord a praise. <clears throat> Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? We thank you that you love us, and in spite of who we are and what the mistakes we make, we thank you that uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we desire to do better, Lord. We desire to align ourselves with you. And uh, um, Lord, I thank you for this time together. I, I'm trusting you, Lord, to each of us, build, that, you're, that you're growing each of us and you're building each of us up. And day by day, we are coming to know you better. And, and, and we are more and more walking in, in holiness and in that, in that separation between um, um, from the world and, and separated unto you. And so, Lord, I thank you for that good work. And I ask blessing over each one in this congregation today. I, I ask for provision over homes. I pray for, 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 for it, over illnesses, Lord, that you'd bring healing. That, Lord, at the end of the day, that you'd show yourself strong and that you'd show yourself real in, in the lives of this congregation, in the personal lives of this congregation, Lord, and, and use each of us to be an influence for you in our families and in our jobs and in our schools, Lord. We submit ourselves to you and we love you and we thank you and we praise you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. And we say all this and we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Say hi to somebody before you go. Amen. <laughs>